अहं बांते जी सरने न सह पंचा सीलानी या चामी दुतियंपी अहं बांते जी सरने न सह पंचा सीलानी या चामी तत्यंपी अहं बांते जी सरने न सह पंचा सीलानी या चामी नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो सम्मा संबुद्धसा 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 नमो तस्स भगवतो अरहतो समा संबुद्धसा नमो तस्सा भगवतो अरहतो समा संबुद्धसा बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दम्मं सरनं गच्छामि दम्मं सरनं गच्छामि संघं सरनं गच्छामि संगं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि बुद्धं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि दम्मं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि दम्मं सरनं गच्छामि दुतियंपि संगं सरनं गच्छामि Tutiyampi sangkang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi buddhang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi dhammang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi sangkang saranang gacchami. Tatiyampi sanggang saranang gacchami. Ti saranang gamanang nititang. Ama bante. Pana tipata viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Pana tipata viramani sikha padang samadhyam. Adinna dana viramani sikha padang samadhyam. अधीना दाना वैरमनी सिखा पदं समाधियामि आमेशु मिच्छाचारा वैरमनी सिखा पदं समाधियामि आमेशु मिच्छाचारा वैरमनी सिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसावादा वैरमनी सिखा पदं समाधियामि मुसावादा वैरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरामेराया मंजपमादर्थाना वैरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि सुरामेराया मंजपमादर्थाना वैरमनि सिखा पदं समाधियामि हिमानि पंचा सिखा पदानि सीले न सुगतिं यंति सीले न भोग संपदा सीले न निबुटिं यंति तस्मा सीलं विसोधा ये साधु 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 Now those beginning with one whose cankers are destroyed mentioned above will describe only the path they have themselves reached. But with a learned man, his instructions and his answers to questions are purified by his having approached such and such teachers. And so he will explain a meditation subject showing a broad track, like a big elephant going through a stretch of jungle and he will select suttas and reasons from here and there, adding explanations of what is suitable and unsuitable. So a meditation subject should be taken 
by approaching the good friend, such as this, the giver of the meditation subject, and by doing all the duties to him. If he is available in the same monastery, it is good. If not, one should go to where he lives. When a bhikkhu goes to him, he should not do so with feet washed and anointed, wearing sandals, with an umbrella, surrounded by pupils, and bringing oil, tube, honey, molasses, etc. He should do so fulfilling the duties of a bhikkhu setting out on a journey, carrying his bowl and robes himself, doing all the duties in each monastery on the way with few belongings and living in the great greatest effacement when entering that monastery he should do so expecting nothing and even provided with a a tooth stick that he has had made allowable on the way according to the rules and he should not enter some other room, thinking, I shall go to the teacher after resting a while and after washing and anointing my feet, and so on. Bante, uh, I think it's related to these chapters as well, or this paragraph as, as well. Uh, I, I've been listening to the last week's recording, and... Uh, you mentioned that even a teacher who is not enlightened can enlighten uh, other students. But uh, what about, you know, the teaching that where the Buddha says that if someone is not out of the mud, basically cannot help others come out of the mud. Uh, but you see, they're not using their own teaching to help the person out of the mud. The Buddha was talking about other teachers and other religions. Anyone who teaches the Buddha's teaching is not the teacher. They're just passing on the teachings of the teacher. That's why we consider the Buddha as our teacher. Ultimately, the Buddha is, if you read in the suttas, it, it'll often say the Buddha is, the, it'll refer to the Buddha as our teacher, even when someone takes teaching from a good friend, from someone who is their teacher. That's why we are not, uh, we are not able to teach. We have to pass along the Buddha's teaching. Well, that would be the wise thing to do, right? But uh, as you mentioned also in the recording, some, I mean, if you are not very well practiced, um, I mean, you tend to modify and add your own thing to it. This is true. But you don't, but tend to, that's, that, that's not quite fair. You tend to because you have ego or you have delusion or so on. Someone doesn't need to be enlightened to be honest or to be uh, dedicated to the Buddhist teaching. And so if if they are the sort of person who is fastidious and honest and straightforward and humble, I think humility plays a large part because there's a lot of ego involved with adding your own uh, interpretation, thinking you know better, thinking you know just as well as the Buddha, or thinking, you know, but there's... It's pretty. It's delusion. Let's say all sorts of delusion that lead you to change the teachings. But if someone is without those, they don't have to be enlightened to to be without those those uh, things to the extent that they're able to faithfully pass on the teaching. You'll see this with a lot of um, a lot of scholarly Buddhist monks who. I mean, hey, they may also have practiced and and become enlightened, but it seems that there are some who are just straightforward and don't seem to understand the teachings deeply, but are faithful to them. And by passing those on, it will be not as effective, but it will still potentially allow students to become enlightened. So we can say that they have to be like really well-versed. If they are not enlightened, then they have to know the Dharma very well. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. They they have to be. They have to present the dhamma. So it's whatever stops them from doing that has to be absent. If it's ego or delusion, or, uh, sometimes it's greed. So they they will say things that are untrue to manipulate their students for their own purposes. 
I mean, even if those are even if those are present, and even if they do distort the teachings, it's still possible for them to present them well enough that the the, per, the, the student who who has to be fairly uh, self sufficient is able to appreciate the teachings and become enlightened to, f- to figure them out for themselves. Yeah, that's what I thought. That if uh, yeah they are not enlightened, it it has to be very very hard for the student to. Mm-hmm. Well, you can also learn from books, right? If you read, suppose you just read the suttas, it's really hard to become enlightened just by reading the suttas, I would think. But you'd have to be a very special person to just read the suttas and become enlightened. But it's possible. Okay, thank you, Bhante. And also, those who have who are able to become easily enlightened, I would imagine they already they have already become enlightened. And- Escape samsara. Now only the people who are remaining are people who have to make an effort, real right. effort. To probably need a there. probably need a pretty good teacher. Yeah. Sixty-seven. Why? If there are bhikkhus there who are hostile to the teacher, they might ask him the reason for his coming and speak this praise of the teacher, saying. You are done for it if you go to him. They might make him regret his coming and turn him back. So he should ask for the teacher's dwelling and go straight there. Wise words. It can certainly happen that living in the same monastery, some monks are hostile towards teachers, even though the teacher might be okay. This scenario has played out meditators leaving because they are told that the teacher is wrong and teaching wrong and so on. Unfortunate. Maybe Mara is busy. Well, there's five kinds of Mara, so all five of them are busy. 68. If the teacher is junior, he should not consent to the teachers receiving his ball and robe and so on. If the teacher is senior, then he should go and pay homage to him and remain standing. When told, put down the robe, the bowl and robe, friend, he may put them down. When told, have some water to drink, he can drink if he wants to. When told, you may wash your feet, he should not do so at once. For if the water has been brought by the teacher himself, it would be improper. But when told, wash, friend, it was not brought by me, it was brought by others, then he can wash his feet sitting in a screened place out of sight of the teacher or in the open to one side of the dwelling. So there's some stuff here that might seem just confusing if you're not clear about the intricacies. I mean, I'm not, I'm not up on the very detailed intricacies either. But you're not allowed to accept senior monks working for you. So if the senior monk brings, I mean, something like that. If the senior monk brings water, you can't use it. You have to be the the junior has to bring it. I'm not quite sure exactly what this is referring to, whether it's student teacher relationship or just junior senior. But junior senior doesn't make any sense because juniors and seniors have to help, still help each other. But junior and senior monks have duties towards each other as well and etiquette towards each other. Seniority is a big deal, and uh, I guess the, the the foot washing shouldn't be done in the presence of the teacher. Some so for some reason. I guess it's disrespectful. If the teacher brings an oil tube, he should get up and take it carefully with both hands. If he did not take it, it might make the teacher wonder, does this bhikkhu resent sharing so soon? But having taken it, he should not annoy his feet at once. For if it were oil for anointing the teacher's limb, it would not be proper. So he should first annoy his head, then his shoulders, etc. 
but one tall. This is meant for all the limbs, friend. Anoint your feet. He should put a little on his head and then anoint his feet. Then he should give it back, saying, when the teacher takes it, may I return this oil tube, Pina River, sir? He should not say, explain a meditation subject to me, Vina River, sir, on the very day he arrives. But, starting from the next day, he can. If the teacher has a habitual attendant, ask, he, ask his permission to do the duties. If he does not allow it, one ask, they can be done when the opportunity offers. When he does them, Three toothsticks should be brought, a small, a medium, and a big one, and two kinds of mouth-washing water and bathing water, water that is hot and cold should be set out. Whichever of these the teacher uses for three days should then be brought regularly. If the teacher uses either kind indiscriminately, he can bring whatever is available. Yeah, you have to you have to bring two sticks to your teacher. So this is referring to the permission to the to do the duties. The, the duties refer to duties that are talked about in the Vinaya for the duties of a student towards a teacher. So it's not just uh, two sticks. I mean, it's things like two sticks, water, bathing water. They, there's lots of things like the, responsible for cleaning the teachers. Goody and that sort of thing. This is between monks, though. For lay people, a... it's not not even appropriate. But uh, but the extrapolation is appropriate. I mean, students do take care of their teachers, obviously. So these days, man, they like we take toothpaste and brush. Yeah. Well, there okay. are still you can actually get these. When we were in India, I got some of these sticks for your teeth, but. I think they're not that good for your teeth. They're not good for your gums. I remember using them and it was pretty hard on the teeth. Doesn't appear to be, or maybe I didn't really know how to use them, but you can actually buy them. We bought some in in Rajagaha once. We were selling them on the side of the road. Tooth cleaning sticks. They're like, uh, you kind of chew on them. And the chewing on them uh, scrapes the fruit off your teeth. I saw a monk yeah, here in Thailand using one once. So why are these duties on the student basically like, is it because it's helping the work of the teacher or is it to humble the student or humble the junior monk or something? Don't think students should care for their teachers? Yes. I mean, does it seem surprising that a student would do these things? I guess it's it, from, in a West, from a Western perspective, it's, the thing is, we, people pay their teachers, right? So we're used to not being very respectful towards the teachers. But I mean, there's so much to it. I mean, it's just there's there's different aspects. There's gratitude. There's respect. There's the things you talked about. I mean, I think I think also. rather than rather than reading too much into it about it humbling the student or being like a teaching or something, it's just it's just the duty of a student towards a teacher. Yeah, and also you are about to ask a huge favor from the teacher, something that could potentially lead you to enlightenment. So showing respect and uh, how grateful you are is, I mean, seems natural. Yeah, and it's not even to make a good impression. I, I like the way it talks about here. It's not even to make a good impression. It's just get, set your priorities straight. You you want to become this person's student, then... then uh, take on the role of a student by by before asking for something by by doing your duties. Don't they say too in the teachings that the student becomes the burden of the teacher? It probably balances things out in that respect. I would imagine. No, there's a ba there's a they they both say that. Ajata ke tani thero mai hang paro ahampi thera sab paro. From this day forward, the elder is my burden, and I also am the elder's burden. Wow, that's so beautiful. I don't know how to word it very well, Bhante, but my mm. thought is that 
um, as the teacher um, who is also like either enlightened or working towards enlightenment, um, that they need to remain mindful um, in their asks of their students, so whether it be material or services. Well, the, the, the teacher doesn't ask of the student, but the student has a, it's, it's, the burden is on the student to do those duties. I mean, honestly, the, the most, I think the, the most important aspect is that um, the teacher is spending their time, spending in the sense of they have only a certain amount of time for their own practice. They're spending time, they're spending energy, and for them to do all of that and to do all of the normal duties of a monk is is an extra burden. So practically speaking, it, it's a good fit for the student to take on some of those duties because the teacher is is uh, preoccupied with teaching. Yeah, here it says, even if the teacher has an habitual attendant, you can ask permission to share some of those duties. And even if uh, that person doesn't allow you to, uh, look after the teacher, uh, you can do it when the opportunity arises. So it's not really about whether the teacher is asking you to do something. So something you do even when the teacher doesn't ask. Sandra, did you have a question? Yes, in paragraph 69, it seems that there is a differentiation between the limbs, meaning one can anoint their shoulders, head, and arms, I think, but uh, they they should wait for an encouragement or to anoint their, their feet. Why, why is that? Well, if you use the, the oil that is meant for the head, for your feet, then it's like it's an insult to the teacher. It's just a cultural thing. But it's an important cultural thing. These ideas between head and feet are important because there's so much... Um, pollution or, or you know bacteria and stuff that is gathered by walking barefoot that if any of that touches your head or somebody else's head or something that touches someone's head or even your hands it can cause diseases so the cultural distinction between head and feet is important or is valuable but it's just a long-standing cultural thing i understand so it, it's also practical there are practical origins i would think but it, it's, it's it's just an ancient, in Thailand it's that way, and in India it was that way in ancient times. Um, maybe I can ask a more specific question, and maybe it'll be clear what I was trying to say. Um, but, but I've experienced a monk that asked um, a student to iron his shirt. Then he, it didn't work out with that student, then asked another student to iron their shirt. So... I guess it's a matter of trust that the monk is not abusing his power that the students will will cater to their, their wants as opposed to needs. So how do we make that difference, Bhante? Well, don't don't take teachers who are abusive or just go away if you, if a teacher is like that. I mean uh, well, ironing shirts isn't a thing that monks do, so I don't know what kind of teacher this was, but it depends. Just asking one person asking another person to iron their shirt, there has to be context, but, you know, find teachers who are worth learning from, I guess. Again, this is in a monastic really? setting, and lay, lay people don't have any of these requirements, but there's certainly ways to extrapolate it. If you're taking a monk as your teacher, you can find ways to do, you know, help that monk out. And if you're taking a lay person as your teacher, you can find ways to help the lay person out. I mean, I, I don't I, it's kind of odd to hear all these questions. It's it's the way you you you're looking at it is for me with my teachers I, it was always like trying to find ways to help, which I mean I guess I guess that that's unspoken here and everyone we're all on the same page there but Really, it's more, uh, I mean, reading these things makes you think, oh, that's so great to have that opportunity to do those things for your teacher. I never really had much opportunity to help Ajahn Tong, but I, I, I was always looking for ways. And every, many people were, I think. I brought him food sometimes, and 
I did help him. I, there was a time where I would walk with him to morning chanting, and he wasn't really keen to have me do it, but I was a bit stubborn at the time until until he finally said not to do it, and I just had to stop. But I would walk with him in the morning to uh, to morning chanting. And it couldn't be because uh, uh, being a monk or being a meditator is a bit different. I mean. For, for for us, when we are going to retreat, I don't know how many opportunities are there uh, for us to serve our teacher. Or uh, maybe you can uh, give us some examples. Can, how can we apply um, the teaching at being a meditator? I don't have any examples. I, I think the intention is is just it's a valuable intention good way to set it's a good attitude to have you should think of uh, desiring to do whatever you can for your teacher i mean you can always ask them if they need anything done i think a big thing for lay people is is offering uh, the necessities making sure that the teacher has food making sure that the teacher has robes and uh, that sort of thing just the basic requisites there's times where some where as a teacher you don't even have enough food. Like take here in, in Wat Lampung, I have so many students. I have 30, 40 students a day, and yet some days I don't get enough food to eat. Or well, it's not really true now, but it it, it could be. Or sometimes the food is not it's true that sometimes the food is not very healthy or so on. It's not I don't mean to complain. It's not a complaint, but it's just funny how it it sort of devolves and there's so much structure and uh bureaucracy, I guess. So that uh, you lose some of this relationship, meditators come here, and it's very transactional. Sometimes that's why we don't like to charge money because we want them to be clear that it's not transactional. That they, that they really get a a feel for it, and you see it in their in their attitudes. Some meditators' attitudes are really not very. Not very respectful, but the problem with lack of respect is is deeper than that. It's they're not taking any taking any of it really seriously, and of course, it makes teaching a lot harder. Having to deal with students who are disrespectful, who are joking, who are talking a lot. Sometimes, the students will spend a lot of time. If you're unless you're unless you're kind of hard on them and tell them, you know, just stick to what's important. But there is a lot of that. So for a student to be conscientious, that's that's what's great about this these passages. Of course, this is by a monk who is probably, or by many monks, this is a tradition for monks who have experienced this. Oh, uh, yes, students who are making the teacher very tired, and then the teacher says, well, why am I teaching again? I'm not, I'm not quite sure why I'm doing this. This is a good question. Why are, pe why are people teaching the Dhamma? It may seem like a bad question. You think, of course people are teaching the Dhamma. They're teaching because they want to teach, which is, of course, the wrong attitude. A teacher who teaches because they want to teach is dangerous. It's not right. Teaching should be because one has been asked, and and even then, you don't, wouldn't do it if it was a real hardship, like if the students were not respectful or not supportive. If it meant that you couldn't do your own pra undertake your own practice. Very true. So I guess um, where this question was coming from is that you know I started with the with the intro of like if let's say the teacher is able to do themselves these things so basically why let the the other person do it and uh, this coming into my case basically i sometimes uh sometimes uh, students offer like something to uh, they want to send this or that and and i'm always saying no or like you know i don't i don't really understand like the teacher's part in this like if you are able and you have let's say money or something like would you still accept or if you don't need it well not if you don't need it but that just means they haven't found a way to give you something you need hmm. And they don't have to. It's not like you're obligated. It's not money. It's not like a, a fee or something. 
It's just they have to be conscientious and, and asking if there's anything you need and looking. It's often asking gets asking is a pain because then the teacher has to think about it, but sometimes they have to look and see how oh, the teacher needs this and make sure that they get what they need, that sort of thing. Without even having to ask is really the best way. But, you know, that's hard. Sometimes it's it's easy and it's of course just a lot easier and kind of lazier to to just ask the teacher. But then the teacher gets asked all the time if they need this, what do they need, what do they need. Sometimes they can't can't always remember what the things they need all the time. But it's so true. If you are not, I mean, you're not starving, then you don't really need much mm-hmm. shelter and food, maybe medicine. Yeah. Well, you still need to do things like sweep your kuti and wash your clothes and. So from one monk to another, the student monk can wash the teacher monk's clothes, the student monk can sweep the teacher monk's kuti, that sort of thing. These are all duties, and they're things we should be considerate about. We're taking this person as our teacher, they're teaching us, let's do something to make their life easier. Yes, thank you. 71. Yes. Why so many words? All should be done as prescribed by the Blessed One in the... Andakas as the right duties in the passage beginning. Bikus, a pupil should perform the duties to the teacher rightly. Herein, this is the right performance of duties. He should rise early, removing his sandals and arranging his robe on one shoulder. He should give the tooth sticks and the mouth washing water. He should prepare the seat. If there is rice gruel, he should wash the dish and bring the rice gruel. To please the teacher by perfection in the duties, he should pay homage in the evening, and he should leave when dismissed with the words, You may go. When the teacher asks him, Why have you come? He can explain the reason for his coming. If he does not ask, but agrees to the duties being done, then after ten days, or a fortnight, have gone by, he should make an opportunity, by staying back one day at the time of his dismissal, and announcing the reason for his coming, or he should go at an unaccustomed time, and when asked, What have you come for? He can announce it. Now, you don't have to follow this to the letter. It might be a little bit stubborn to do this sometimes. Like if if someone has a a limited amount of time, you might say, I can't wait 10 days or a fortnight. This is, remember, this is also between monks and this is, it's, it's a different case. You can't apply these as lay people. But it's, uh, it's quite interesting. I'm trying to find these words. Yahi. The word is Yahi. You may go. If the teacher says, come in the morning, he should do so. But if his stomach burns with a bile affliction at that hour, or if his food does not get digested owing to sluggish digestive heat, or if some other ailment afflicts him, he should let it be known and proposing a time that suits himself, he should come at that time. For if a meditation subject is expounded at an inconvenient time, one cannot give attention. This is the detailed explanation of the words, approach the good friend, the giver of a meditation subject. Now, as the words, one that suits his temperament, Paragraph 28. There are six kinds of temperament, that is, greedy temperament, hating temperament, deluded temperament, faithful temperament, intelligent temperament, and speculative temperament. Some would have 14, taking these six single ones together with the four made up of the three double combinations and one triple combination with the greed triad and likewise with the faith triad. 
But if this classification is admitted, there are many more kinds of temperament possible by combining greed, etc., with faith, etc. Therefore, the kinds of temperament should be understood briefly as only six. As to meaning the temperaments are one, that is to say, personal nature, idiosyncrasy. According to these, there are only six types of persons. That is, one of greedy temperament, one of hating temperament, one of deluded temperament, one of faithful temperament, one of intelligent temperament, and one of speculative temperament. So this is a new section. That last section is finished, and now we're into the section on temperaments. Bandhu, what is the word in Pali for temperament? Here it is char charya. But I've heard it as charita. It's funny that here it's charya. But it was charita. Oh, here we are. Ju you know, it is charita. So I guess they are... Oh, I see, I see. And it's interesting. So the English doesn't pass that along, but in the first part he talks about charya, and then in the second, at the end part, he enumerates them as charita. Why is that? That's just a grammar thing, I guess, but it looks like charya is the correct word. Charita refers to a person, person who has a charya. Who has charya? Charya is the temperament. And charita, I think, refers to a person. It's just grammatical. I'm just trying to figure out which one is the right word. But I think charya is actually the right word for the thing. If you're talking about the temperament itself, that's charya. If you're talking about a person who has the temperament, that person is charita. So, buddhi. Uh, Buddhicharita, Sadhacharita, and so on. But the temperaments themselves are Charya. I thought not that Charita is uh, personality and Charya is your activities or what you do. I don't think so. Not according to the Pali here. I mean, they're, they're really the same word. It's just different grammar. Charya... Sorry, yeah, oh, your behavior. Sure what the yeah means. But the ta is probably a person who has. I'm not sure about the grammar, actually. Let's look at this because it's talking about it here. He's trying to explain it, I think. Yeah, no, the charita is referring to the person, the person who is raga charita. So the charita is referring to the person. This person is this and such and such charita. But the actual temperament itself is charya. So if you look at it, it's just the just Pali thing. I mean, it's not important for understanding the ideas. It's just, if you want the term, the term looks to be charya. 75. Herein, one of faith, faithful temperament is parallel to one of greedy temperament because faith is strong when profitable karma occur, occurs in one of greedy temperament owing to its special qualities being near to those of greed. For in an unprofitable way, greed is affectionate and not over austere and so in a profitable way is faith. Greed seeks out sense desire as object, while faith seeks out the special qualities of virtue and virtue and so on. And greed does not give up what is harmful while faith does not give up what is beneficial. One of intelligent temperament is parallel to one of hating tem hating temperament because Understanding is strong when profitable karma occurs in one of hating temperament owing to its special qualities being near to those of hate. 
For in a non-profitable way, hate is disaffected and does not hold to its object and so on, and, and so in a profitable way is understanding. Hate seeks out only unreal faults, while understanding seeks out, out only real faults. And hate occurs in the mode of condemning living beings, while understanding occurs in the mode of condemning formations. 27. One of speculative temperament is parallel to one of deluded temperament, because obstructive applied arise often in one of deluded temperament, who is striving to arouse unreasoned profitable states, owing to their special qualities being near to those of delusion. For just as delusion is restless owing to perplexity, so are applied thoughts that are due to thinking or thinking over various aspects. And just as delusion facilitates owing to superficiality, so do applied thoughts that are due to facile conjecturing. Others say that there are three kinds of temperament with craving, pride, and views. Hearing, craving is simply greed, and pride is associated with that. So neither of them exceeds greed. And since view, views have their source in delusion, the temperament of views falls within the deluded temperament. Um, but can you explain the 76th intelligent temperament in your own words? It's saying that these two types of temper, these two temperaments are parallel, they're similar. Okay, like they sort of like run together? I'm not really sure what the point is, but he's pointing out how similar they are, how they're similar. It's interesting, I guess, but I don't, I'm not quite sure what the point of it is. I don't think there's any great point to these paragraphs. It's it's interesting, but not really valuable. I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but you still want to be clear which temperament someone is and give to them based on that. I don't think there's any reason to know that they are similar. I mean, I guess it helps you understand what, what each of them is, so that if you understand one, you can understand the other because of their similarity. That That's helpful, I guess. Um, because one thing that I, I'm realizing as I meditate is that when I don't understand something, surprisingly, I get upset. Like, I am... I, um, I get angry, so I'm wondering if that's kind of like it relates to what is being said in this paragraph. No, if you're angry, these characters are, are only useful for samatha practice. This is the beginning of the discussion of samatha meditation. So, but these are these are not talking about your your experiences during practice. These are enumerating the types of people in a certain classification for the purpose of deciding which meditation subject to give them. I guess okay, that wasn't maybe make... clear, but but this this these six are are something that a teacher has to look at and a student can also can contemplate, but mostly for the teacher. Okay, thank you, Bhante. What I found interesting in that uh, paragraph is uh, the comparison between hate and understanding. It says hate seeks out only unreal faults. So it, it's like dislike something that is not real, while understanding seeks out only real faults. Like what's wrong with the uh, formations, which is uh, very nice to see the comparison. It's like if you, when you give up on the real giving up, comes through understanding. It's not you are disliking, you are hating the world, you are living play life, so you are hating something, disliking something. It comes through understanding. Uh, this passion of giving up comes through understanding. That's how I saw that. I mean, it, I know it's meant for samatha, but that's the idea came to me. Dante, 
What does it mean by faithful temperament is parallel to one of greedy temperament? If someone is greedy and faithful, does it mean that the greedy temperament uh, counterbalance the strength of the greedy temperament? I think what you're all kind of coming across here is that people are complex. We don't really easily fit into these neat categories. So it make the only the only takeaway from that is that it's going to be hard for a teacher to decide which temperament a person is. But it sounds like you're also all trying to apply this to your own practice, which is not not what these are meant for. This isn't this isn't something that you should use as dhamma, not 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 really in that way. These are instructions on how to decide which meditation subject is going to be most suitable for you. I guess, and as I said, I think the only reason for comparing them, for paralleling them like this, besides interest sake, um, it helps, it's for helping you understand them and recognize them because of their similarities and their differences. You see, they're parallel, but they're opposites. He's pointing out how these are opposites to each other. So you can notice the similarities and the differences between people who are one or the other. But again, we're all going to have, to some extent, all six of these, right? So it's just which one is the most prevalent. I guess Thank most uh, most importantly, which one, which one is going to be the most strongest defilement that you have? Which, can, which your defilements are going to relate to which one the most? Yeah, very true. So I was just looking at this combinations of uh, the 14 and that... Um, is more it, it's making more sense some of the temperaments can combine with this or that or even uh, the triads like a uh, greed triad or triple combination with the greed triad and likewise with the fate triad so we don't need to correct ourselves it's just a meditation object well Temperament is our long-standing habits, right, from samsara. This is what we cultivate, anger, greed, whatever. And uh, this is, it's useful to know, like, well, how you operate, what, what's the underlying operation or program that's running in the background. It, it, isn't that still useful, Bante, to know? I don't think it's that useful. I think the problem with these things is going to be that you're going to identify with them and have a sense of personality, and it will support your sense of personality. I don't think these are a very valuable teaching at all. <laughs> That's, I guess, heretic. No, they're valuable in the context. I mean, they're essential in the context, but out of context, I don't think this is something that you should be all that interested in at all. Bhante, isn't the proper translation of rag passion is the greed i mean I, they are uh, synonymous in the, some context but in the uh, yeah i mean business. i think in this in this context it might be proper but it, yeah it doesn't mean greed it means passion or lust lust which would then be greed but i mean i have uh, had both the terms uh, both raga charita and loba charita which i guess are synonymous in this context Bante Murda has a question in the chat, I guess two, maybe. So why are these temperaments important to samatha practice, but not vipassana? Is it because we are trying to transcend our temperaments in this practice, meaning vipassana? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. So the answer in brief is that the samatha practices are designed they're not designed, but they're differentiated based on their their power to counteract certain defilements or counter counteract certain, let's say, yeah, bad habits, excesses, that sort of thing. So they they're not designed for that because really anyone can take any of the forty samatha practices. It's just some are going to be harder to practice. Because for samatha, you need a calm mind, you need a stable mind, you need a strong mind. And so you're better off finding something that is more conducive to quenching your hindrances, your specific hindrances. 
more quickly. Now with vipassana, we're not trying to counteract our defilements. We're not trying to counteract greed or anger. We're trying to cut off delusion. So there are differences of character that apply, but there's a different categorization. There's really only two character types, and that is one is passionate. So this is raga charita there probably doesn't mean greedy temperament. Here, I think it, it there's an argument to be made for it meaning greedy temperament, but could also be just passionate. But there it means more passion. So it could be greed, it could be anger, but just be passionate as opposed to opinionated, someone who has a lot of views. So there's the two. There's raga charita and diti charita for vipassana meditation, but both of them still take the four foundations of mindfulness. It's just uh, raga charita should focus on the first two more and diti charita should focus on the third and fourth more. Uh, this will be mentioned here, won't it? No, that's from the Satipatthana commentary. Oh, thank you. Uh, Bante, Peter has a question as well. Are these for teachers to use, not students? Do not take More too teachers. Much it's, it's not likely to be very useful for students. Like you're going to, you're, you're asking the teacher to give you a, a meditation subject. So it's up to them to decide. And you could do it together. You could, I mean, the thing, the problem is that the teacher doesn't yet know you even, perhaps. So it's a real challenge for them to figure out which one is good for you. So sometimes through discussion, they can figure out, we can figure out together which one's suitable. Sometimes teachers are very astute that way. They can see very quickly which one's going to be valuable. All right, thank you. I'll have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Bante.